I have to say I'm a little nervous. Uh, I've often talked about tech tech-y stuff in front of a group of people, but it's pretty rare that I talk about things that are a little bit more personal. And so this, I'm feeling a little, little heart in my throat right now, but I'm sure it's, it's going to be OK. Um, so yeah, um, I'm going to talk about my experience uh, as part of a queer family, I guess, uh, and trying to deal with um, things like parental leave uh, as an employee of a tech company, and in particular as a job candidate at um, a tech company. Um, and so when I was thinking about this talk, um, I realized that actually this isn't something that applies to me, just, just to me. This is actually a sort of broader issue with the way that family leave policies are often written at companies, and it could apply to a really wide variety of families. So I was like, what should I even call this talk? Um, modern family just seemed, I sort of thought about that, but it just seemed like, oh, they have a TV show, I'm not going to do that. Um, and... Uh, and yeah, so this, this really represents my experience, I guess. I thought about just calling this whole thing tech in the family, but that seemed sort of weird, too. It seemed like I may be talking about like apps for kids or something. So anyway, <laughs> that's what you get. Um, yeah, so, um, so my goal in talking right now is, first of all, to help you or anyone you know um, navigate family leave systems or policies, in particular at, is that going to work, at... Uh, at tech companies and other similar companies that offer, in many cases, relatively generous, although sometimes confusing, policies. Um, and my sub-goal is to help companies make this easier for us. Um, so if you are a person who uh, is thinking about being a parent at some point, um, this could be useful to you. If you are a person who has ever worked at a place that has any kind of HR policies at all, this hopefully will be useful to you too, so you can help make those um, better and more inclusive and more useful to everyone. Caveats, one, I only know what is my own experience. Um, so if you have had a different experience, I, I haven't done a ton of research on this, and honestly, I tried to do some, and it was hard to find information really at all. Two, not a lawyer. Please don't take whatever I say and tell your HR people that you heard it at a conference and thus it must be true. It's true for me, and this is my experience. But if you actually have a situation where you're, you're thinking that legal action might be required or something is... Um, is like that, you should find an actual lawyer. I'm a software developer. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, first I wanted to start by talking about what is family leave anyway. Um, when people say family leave, they're usually talking about two different things. One of them is the uh, ability to take time off your job without being fired for doing it. Um, so that's really important, but it's also very different from being paid, right? So, so family leave is basically these two things. Time off, protected time, and payment for that time. Um, what I'm not going to talk about, and I'm going to talk about both of those. What I'm not going to talk about here is the sort of general American family leave system, which, like, if you Google American per parental leave or whatever, you're going to get a million articles about how we are, like, among countries with similar economic whatever, we are just, like, the bottom of the heap. It's, it's depressing and difficult. And I'm also not going to talk about how, sorry, I just moved that about how incredibly unfair our system is for, in particular for um, hourly workers, contract workers. Um, a lot of other people have covered this way better than I can. Um, in particular, locally, the DC Paid Family Leave Coalition is really great, and they are starting to see results. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is particularly my experience in the tech industry um, in a situation where I do have a fair number of options. Um, again, yeah. So this is my little family. Um, my wife is actually back there. Hi, Eliza. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Trout, you can't really see her, but Trout the dog in the middle there was not invited to come along. Um, but we are hoping to add another member to our family sometime soon. Um, we are legally cleared to be adoptive parents. And um, we are just basically waiting to be matched with the right kid. So hopefully, there will be another little person in that cut trunk of our car, I guess. No, not really soon. Um, and well. During this time, between while we were being legally cleared and while since we've been legally cleared, I did a job search. So um, I had the opportunity to ask a lot of questions about parental leave. I knew I was going to need it. I had the opportunity to ask the questions while I was talking to a number of companies, um, mostly sort of in the tech, at least tech adjacent space. Um, so yeah, so I learned a lot about what was going to work for me and what wasn't. Um, so here are some things that in conversations with hiring managers, either after I had been made an offer or in some cases before an offer had been made that were assumed about me, some of them 
very explicitly, some of them implicitly, it turned out when I started reading the things that they were sending me. So, um, and some of these things are true, just to be clear. It's not like everything that they thought about me was wrong. It's just that in terms of, uh, and, and sometimes it was just irritating, but sometimes they actually sent me information based on these assumptions that wasn't going to work for me. It was inaccurate. It was wrong. It didn't work. So um, I'm going to read these out. Uh, I, they assume that I'm a cisgendered woman, that I'm married, that the person I'm married to is a man, um, that I'm bi biologically able to give birth and will choose to do so, that my child will join my family as an infant, and that I will be the primary caregiver for my child. Um, in each of these cases, every single one of these things in some way uh, altered the way that they talked about, about parental leave with me. Um, here are some examples of families like mine and not like mine in a lot of ways, where these assumptions break down and where a family leave policy, a parental leave policy that's structured for one of these families isn't going to work. So um, I actually have, have one example uh, of a friend of mine. I have a lot. Actually, one, one night when I was trying to fall asleep, um, I like thought of all the families as I was kind of starting to think about this. I thought of every family I know who doesn't fit into the like box that family leave is intended for, and I like fell asleep, but I was still thinking of them when I fell asleep. Um, but uh, so an example I wanted to give, uh, one, of, one of my neighbors um, is an immigrant, and for immigration reasons, her son had to live with his grandmother in the country that they came from until he was 15. So they were apart basically for 12 years, I think, I think it's about right. And uh, then he was, due to a change in immigration situation, he was able to join them. So she has a 14-year-old kid, 14 or 15-year-old kid, who shows up in her family, and like they, I mean, she's his mother, she saw him a couple of times during that time, but not all that often. Uh, that's a situation where um, that is not covered by the policy that HR has written about family leave and parental leave, but it's a situation where she has some very specific needs, and, uh, and they need to be taken care of. So, yeah. Um, I could, if you, if you want more examples, I can keep going here, and I'm sure you can think of families that you know that are like this. So um, I'm going to talk about, as I said, I'm going to talk about leave and compensation. Um, one thing, when, when you say family leave or parental leave, one of the first things that people think of is the Family Medical Leave Act. Um, it's a federal law that has different implementations in each state. Um, again, I'm not a lawyer. Please don't quote me to any lawyer. Um, and... Uh, it applies to most, but not all, full-time employees. Um, it depends somewhat on the size of your company. Uh, and uh, in general, it gives you something on the order of 14 weeks off um, to care for a dependent without risking your job. This is no guarantee of pay. All it says is if you take the time off, we won't, we, they can't fire you. That's it. Um, and so it requires a minimum company size. Um, you, and something that was actually an issue for me is that you have to have been with your company for a year before it kicks in. So it's, these are just important things to know about Family Medical Leave Act. But the most important thing to know is if you are eligible, this is your baseline. This is where you start. And it's actually a pretty inclusively written policy. Um, it applies not only to children or dependents. It also applies to you can often take time off to care for a sick parent or spouse or something. Um, Compensation for family leave is offered by many companies that um, are, are particularly interested in, are, very, are competing for employees, is, the, is sort of the impression that I get of like, where is this offered. So tech is a really good example. Tech companies, especially these days, are competing for women, and they have found or been told or whatever that having a paid family leave policy is a way to retain and keep them. And also, it's just a good policy, I mean, honestly. Um, these policies are not covered by any kind of law. They vary a lot um, and are non-standard, and you probably, you're going to need to ask for it almost every time, or it's going to be given to you in an HR manual when, you, um, when you're talking to people. So that's the difference, leave versus compensation. Um, so in looking at policies, this is like the first roadblock. Once I kind of got my head around, like, what, what does family leave actually even mean? This is the first stumbling block that, like, was totally unexpected to me and was, was, ex took some navigating. So um, maternity, it turns out, the word maternity refers to a, almost always in policies, refers to a disability condition, which is the condition of having given birth. So that means that if somebody, this is, this is, what, ha this is what kept on happening. I would say, I need information about your parental leave policy. And they would say, great, our maternity leave policy is six weeks paid, six weeks paid. And I'd be like, that's great. 
does it apply to me? If I am an adoptive parent, am I eligible for, for maternity leave? Um, and uh, I have to tell you, HR usually knew, but a lot of times the hiring manager, the person I was talking to, did not know the answer to that question. They also assumed that maternity meant, like, woman parent or something. I don't know. Um, and so, uh, yeah. Um, the option for leave, a problem that I encountered, and you'll see this on the next slide a little too, is that the other option at most company, at companies that use the maternity structure is often called paternity leave. And I was like, okay, that's weird. Like, I'm, I definitely am a parent who expects to be a mother, which is a word I associate not with paternity. So, um, yeah. So the, the, I just want to point out that I definitely do not begrudge people who have given birth a potentially different leave policy, right? Like, it's... Giving birth is a dramatic medical event, as well as a lot of other things, and uh, and that is leave that that people who have given birth might need. The issues here are one, making sure that enough leave is provided to all families; two, avoiding assumptions; and three, having a policy that's going to be clear, so you don't end up with a situation. I mean, I asked all these questions as I was being hired. Imagine if I hadn't thought to ask these questions and instead had gone in to the HR office, you know, three days before I was about to pick up a kid and said, I need this six weeks of maternity leave, and they'd been like, oh, I'm sorry, that doesn't apply to you. So here's an example. This is a story. It was on CNN three days ago. Um, it was basically written straight from a Department of Defense press release. Um, I, like, put lots of dots in there to just get the important parts. I'm going to read it out loud. Defense Secretary Ashton Carter announced that the military will provide 12 weeks of maternity leave for mothers across the military. Um, and just as a aside, women in the Navy used to have 18 weeks, so he noted, women who in the Navy who are currently pregnant would still be eligible for 18 weeks of maternity leave. Carter said he would seek authority to allow an increase in paternity leave to 10 days from the current, to 14 days from the current 10. I don't even know what this means to me, right? I have no idea where I fall in this story. If I were in the military, I'm sure I would have done the research, but as somebody who is potentially, I mean, and I just, I, this is one of many stories that I could have cited. This is the one that happened to pop up in the news this week. So this is the, this is the issue. Um, one other thing that I want to note here is that uh, another, it, either, either the situation here is that I'm eligible for paternity leave, which is, seems weird to me, but okay, or there's a, that, or I'm eligible for maternity leave after not having given birth, and there's a huge, weird gender difference here, which also seems kind of unfair, right? Like, if in a situation where my wife and I both got maternity leave, that would be kind of awesome for us, but imagine, I mean, I now know a lot of couples who are adopting kids, and several of them are gay male partners, and uh, that's not fair to them either. I mean, the whole... The, there's, there's basically no way to read this that isn't either confusing or unfair. Um, oh, and I also want to add that any gender difference that isn't based on a medical condition is, like, not trans-inclusive. Um, so another thing I want to talk about is sickness. Um, a very common way to get paid for parental leave is through sick leave which it turns out is really only eligible to you if you are sick or disabled or potentially caring for someone who's sick or, or disabled. For example, my colleague who has a four-year-old, whenever she's sick, he gets to take a sick day. So your child is not considered sick unless they're sick, right? Even a three-day-old, if they're not in the hospital, is not sick or disabled. So that means that you actually, in many cases, can't take that leave if you haven't given birth or if you're not caring for somebody who has given birth, which is like, I mean, again, I'm... I'm not begrudging, I'm not, I'm not saying that that shouldn't be the case, I'm saying that there needs to be an alternative, because saying like, oh, I'm sorry, you can't get paid, be, like, there's no option for you, basically, because of the way we structure, structured our system, I think is not really a fair or, uh, or workable option for a lot of people. Also, a lot of HR managers also don't know this. This is, again, a lot of cases, it's just like a, another thing you have to ask. You have to confirm when they say, oh, this is how our policy works, you're going to need to ask if you're in this situation. So this is kind of a weird one to put on here, nursing. So I have done, I've done a lot of research on being an adoptive parent. Um, my wife has actually done more research. She is the researcher in the family. But in general, I was not aware until pretty recently that induced lactation is a thing that you can do. It's n not, I, I, mean, I don't want to say not all that difficult. It is a path that has been trodden by many people 
to be able to nurse a child who was not, yeah, after not having given birth to, to anyone, I guess. Um, I don't know if I want to do this. Haven't really given it that much thought. I don't really want to jump into the debate on whether this is a good thing or a bad thing or a good thing or a neutral thing or whatever. What I do want to do is say that it is an option that people who adopt and people who have a child through other, through other methods that are not giving birth have, might consider. So federal law says that a company has to provide space for uh, nursing, usually nursing mothers, they say, um, for people who are, are nursing so that they can pump during the day. Um, unfortunately, in many companies, that space is not like readily provided. It's available by request because like either there's a key to it to prevent it, I've heard a lot of times, prevent it from being abused, which seems like a weird thing, or, um, or like they don't have it because they don't have anyone and so they have to like convert a closet or conference room or something. Um, I just, this is like all I have to say about this. I just want you to imagine, like imagine that I decide to do this. It does involve a ton of pumping in order to make this thing happen. Imagine that I want to do this and I have to go into my HR department and explain to them what I need. Like I just want you to imagine that conversation and I'm basically going to move on from this slide. Um, <laughs> except that I want to say one more thing which is that I think there's an easy solution to this which is just make the room available. Like, even if you, you don't even have to call it a lactation room or a pumping room or whatever. I mean, I, I know people who have diabetes for whom having a, a private space where they can take care of what they need to take care of that is not a bathroom would be, like, life-altering. So make, make the room available. If it gets abused, like, take care of it. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to wrap up now with just some, some suggestions for what to do if you're in this situation and then also what to do if you are in an, an employer. Um, my number one, so if you're an employee who's looking at this kind of thing, um, doing research and asking questions is just going to be critical. You're not, you're not going to be able to avoid that. One really important thing is to know the local laws before you do that, because there are still places where you can be fired for being gay, legally. So don't go in and say, hi, I have a lot of questions. I'm going to disclose a lot of information about myself if that, if that puts you at risk of being fired. Um, Finding an ally, finding somebody who's gone through it before, even if it's not um, somebody who's gone through exactly the same situation. Eliza um, did pretty well by uh, just finding somebody who had recently gone on maternity, on parental leave, they call it maternity leave, at her office. And um, that was able to help her at least know what the baseline was so that she could figure out how it was going to work for her. Um, ask for the as written policy all the time. You should, people should be, I don't even know why they send you a not as written policy. You need the actual policy because otherwise you're going to, you're stuck with the assumption that people are making when they're writing you a summary. Um, challenge obviously unfair policies if you're in a position to do so. A colleague of mine who just adopted a five-year-old uh, challenged a policy that was like ridiculous and they basically couldn't figure out how to defend it. They were like, oh yeah, okay, uh, we're giving you an exemption and we'll look into changing that. Um, and it worked really well. Um, I just, oh, as written, and I said, and get responses in writing, even just like, because you might have to deviate from a policy anyway, get those in writing, obviously. And then this is, it's a stressful po process. I can't speak to other kinds of child acquiring, I guess is the <laughs> thing, I, the broad term I could say, but adopting is a stressful process. Um, and uh, this has made it a little bit more stressful. Take care of yourself. All right, if you're an employer, um, make your policy work for your people um, by clarifying and including. Uh, the number one thing, and I think the more I think about this, I think this should be on the top of every HR policy. We will not penalize you for asking questions. We will not pen penalize you for disclosing your personal situation. It should be on the top of every HR policy. Um, use inclusive language inside of that. Um, and oh, I'm going to, about point one, I'm also going to say, uh, make, this is especially true in states that don't have like an Employment Non-Discrimination Act or where you're talking about cl class categories that aren't covered by that kind of thing. Like, make that really clear. Um, using inclusive language, the word maternity, as it's used in policies, could be replaced with like, leave after giving birth. 100% of the time, and then nobody would, like, nobody would have to have this confused conversation. It would be done. It would be, like, it's a free change that you can make to your policy. Do it. Um, respond to all inqu inquiries with a full policy. Um, another one is, is educate yourself. Um, if you're a big organization, it's probably worth uh, knowing 
what modern adoption looks like. It's probably worth understanding what the foster care system in your area looks like, that, that sort of thing. Um, and finally, just remember that retaining a good employee is worth, is worth more than like paying out a couple extra sick days for me. Um, so I've added just a few resources. Uh, that's, that's it, kind of. I've added a few resources. Um, the Deborah, I just want to make a point about two of these. One of them is that Moms Rising, they have so much good information. They are like huge abusers of the maternity, paternity leave thing. I sent them an email and asked them to stop, and they sent me a really nice email back. But they haven't changed anything. So, but they do have a lot of good information. It was like a week ago, I'm sure they're, you know, whatever. They sent me a really nice email. Um, these nursing resources, these are kind of like, should you decide you want to do this, here's how, how, here are resources for doing it. I didn't put like, should you do this resources on there. I'm sure you can find them. Um, I'm not like endorsing doing this. I just, it, it's something I didn't know about and I want to share the information. Um, so yeah, that's it. I have like 30 seconds if there's one question. Maybe. Is this going to be available uh, for us to, to get? I think so. I, I think so. Is it available somewhere? Sure. I'll find a way to, I'll find a way to make it available. So if um, you're in the process of looking for a job and you're given that you could be fired or you could encounter some type of, of bias um, in the interview or hiring process, do you have a recommendation for when would be a good time to ask this question? So yeah, um, I I mean so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say that I'm doing this from a place of enormous privilege. I work as a software developer. Um, I've never had a situation where I have been unwillingly unemployed for more than like a few weeks. Um, so I felt pretty good about basically walking in and asking these questions in the interview process. And I've always, I've, I've applied for a lot of jobs and I've always sort of come out, I guess, in like the first conversation I have with them because if they're even going to raise their eyebrow, I don't want to work with them. Um, I usually just say like, oh, my wife and I have been, you know, whatever, casually. Um, and I ask these questions like not in the first conversation, but usually like very quickly. Um, that's not the answer for everyone, right? I mean, sometimes it might be you don't want to talk to the person who's actually hiring you. You want to talk to HR instead later. They should be a little bit better about knowing the rules. But again, you have to know the law um, and make sure that you're not going to be discriminated against or fired for that.